whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, whether I find a place in this world or never belong, I gotta be me. It's obvious your dad was very well liked, very well respected, but I want to turn to you a little bit. What was it like growing up in your family? Oh, when I was, I didn't know my father till I was 10 years old. When I was six years old, he went to jail for, for shooting Frankie Kid Bruno in Williamsburg, who was a, a, a neighborhood bully. And Frankie Kid Bruno was a price fighter, a professional fighter, and he used to shake down the bar owners. The bar owners got together and hired the young kid because this is after the Al Capone deal, and they figured he's the one who could handle this punk. So my father challenged this Frankie Kid Bruno, and what happened was he shot him in the ass he, to make it look like he was running away. And he was running away because my father challenged him with a gun, you know. He wasn't going to challenge him with his hands. Well, growing up after that, I found out that from the, through the grapevine and uh, how the fighters uh, in the dressing room, in the locker rooms, when I was an amateur fighter at 15, 16 years old, I was in the Golden Gloves, I was in the CYO, I was uh, in the United States Air Force, representing the United States Air Force as, a, as a, an amateur fighter leading up to the Olympics. I was also a pro as Tony Rio over in New Mexico, uh, defending myself. But what was it like growing up? being Jimmy Knapp's son, was a red carpet treatment because after my father got out of jail for attempted murder on Frankie Kid Bruno, and Frankie Kid Bruno never gave my father up. There was witnesses outside the bar on the sidewalk that gave him up and identified him, but Frankie Kid Bruno was a stand-up guy till the day he died, and he died of a beating in, uh, in, in a park in Maspeth, uh, Queens. And that's the way he dies because he was a bad apple and you die that way, yes. But I defied my father at all times. He's a boss. I want to be a boss. I have my own crew. He takes my crew. He's the boss, yes, over me too. But only one man, only one man on the face of this earth at the time, with all the bosses and all five families, could ever control me, and that was him. And guess what? All the bosses went to him when they had a problem with me. They didn't handle me directly because he was an influential man and he had a lot of power what we call politics in the mob, that the bosses feared him if they try to do away with one of his children. But the code in the street goes this way. When you're a boss, and if you're a made man as well, and then one of your kind, your children or relatives, cause disrespect in the mob life, you take care of them. You have to whack them out. Be, and that's the code that you take when you take Omerta, you put the organized crime family ahead of your immediate family. Now, what happens is this. The bond between Jimmy Knapp, my father, and me was stronger than Omerta, the oath he took when he was 65 years old. Very unusual that a man 65 years old becomes a capo right off the bat and picks the family he wants to go into. So he picks the Rolls Royce of all families, the Genovese family. So now what happens is this. By him doing that, he has control and he had to identify himself before he went away to do that last seven years in jail. If he didn't identify himself with a family and take that oath, he would have lost a number of business to other people while he was doing that seven years because his supervisors were weaklings and gamblers. And they wasted the money and he made a deal with the Genovese people, the bosses, leave his number of business alone, which is $150 million a year. And you leave that business alone and leave my blood-related people and my supervisors and my controllers alone. There's enough money for them to spend and do what they want, but. I'll settle with you when I get out of jail. And if I die in jail, the business is yours. And he told that to the bosses. There's enough of an overlay, always money in reserve out there. And he gave them a list of all his controllers, all of his supervisors when he went away. And the bosses in the Genovese family 
protected his number business, and when he got out, he owed a half a million dollars to them. They paid out for him. But they gave him that kind of money with, to the supervisors to make payouts. Why? Because it was in dribs and dribs, 50,000, 30,000. It totaled up in seven years to a half a million dollars in the deficit of a $150 million a year number business. So he settled with them, he came to see me, in 1990, two years before he died. And he stayed with me 12 hours a day, schooling me on everything, and schooling me because he tells me, he said, don't ever get in it. It's not worth it. Your dad was in charge of the largest gambling empire in the United States. He was the boss. At home, your mother was the boss. Ah. And I, I really would like to know a little bit about that. All right, my mother was the... The general, we used to call her General MacArthur in the household, because my father was in and out of jail. Who's taking care of these kids? There's altogether at the time five of us. My mother did the cooking. When my father was in jail after the Frankie Kid Bruno shooting, that was back in 1941, and he didn't get out until 19, 1945. So now my mother, I saw her, we lived in the back room of a grocery store. We lived in the back room of a knitting mill. My mother took care of us, and she was doing what they call in those days during the Second World War, piecework. She would make dresses, she was sewing in a sewing machine, and she couldn't go to the factory, so they send the work to her because she had to take care of us. She couldn't afford a babysitter. And at the time, I'm six years old till I'm ten years old, when I started going to grammar school, we didn't start till late, maybe seven, eight years old. That's why when I graduated from high school, I was 20 years old. I wasn't 18 years old because I started school late in life. And I saw her. And when my father came back out of jail, it took him about a year to come back to her. And now that's when he was reorganizing his mind when after he did time in Sing Sing. And he met all the big boys there. When you do time, you get worse. It's in other words, you meet the big boys in there, and you do favors for them. And he was the tough guy. He helped Fat Tony Salerno. He helped Joe Adonis. He helped uh, quite a few of those uh, bosses when they were in jail. They weren't bosses at the time, but they were potential bosses. They remembered Jimmy Knapp defending him against uh, the different nationalities and the different groups in Sing Sing. He, would, he was a, a tough guy. He was a tough guy then, then later on, he became a sensible man and a well-knowledgeable and scholastic type guy. He was self-taught. So uh, I have to say that he, um, he reorganized and he became, before he became a made man at 65 years old, he became a capo. Before that, he was the advisor to all five families because to be the advisor to all five families is not a consulier. A consulier is a... Is a the advisor for one of the, each for the family you're the consulier for. My father was voted by the, the heads of the family and by the commission to be the consulier for all five families investing their money in Cuba and in Vegas and in Reno, Nevada and the Bahama Highlands in legalized gambling casinos. And he chose me to learn and go to gambling school to learn how to, uh, about how to set up a casino type operation, how to hide the money, how to skim off the top for the boys, not for myself, but I did it for myself too. Well, I know that your father, it's obvious, your father was a big influence on you as, an, as a young adult through your adult life. I think it's safe to say that your mother was a big influence on you as a child. Uh, my mother and my father through life, people would say they look more like brother and sister when he came back to her after he got out of Sing Sing, he had 15000 in cash. Where he got it from, I don't know. But now I'm 10 years old. And he told my mother, he said, listen, we were on 42nd Street, Flatbush Avenue, in a two-family house, I'll never forget. And my mother was paying the rent because none of those guys came to help her because he didn't have a crew then. He didn't have, he was a young Jimmy and after. My mother paid him. My mother accepted him back, and it was snowing out, 
and me and my brothers and sister had to stay outside on the front porch of the house so my father was inside with my mother. They are making amends. He was making amends. Well, anyway, my father gave my mother 15 grand after he gets out of Sing Sing, and she buys a house on Mitch Parton Avenue in Ridgewood, a two-family house, and we all settled there when I was, since I was 10 years old, and that's the same place uh, that uh, to, it was in 1990 was sold by my younger brother because he inherited everything on that house. But my mother had her crew. Her crew was her children. Well, my father went out and took care of his crew from 11 in the morning until 4 in the morning. And that would be, he was promoting gambling, the Ziganet games, that's an Italian card game, uh, gin rummy, uh, craps on, in Harlem on 2nd Avenue, 114th Street with Fat Tony Salerno at the um, Palm Boys Social Club was a front that candy store, and in the back, on that crap table, when they weren't shooting craps, they were cutting up money from Las Vegas, Nevada, because in that dirty store, in that all dust was built Las Vegas, Nevada, because my father was told to keep an eye on Maya Lansky. That was his position, to keep an eye on him when they went to Cuba, and they had Frank Sinatra carrying the attache with the money in, a million dollars, to give to Batista, who allowed them to open up gambling casinos. So my father had to challenge Lansky, who was a very close friend of Batista. So my father didn't trust Maya Lansky till the day he died. My father said, I don't trust this Jew. He said, I, I, uh, I deal with the Jewish people in partnerships and whatnot in the number business, but this Jew, I don't trust him. He's with too many politicians all over the world. And he has a hold on them somehow, some way. And all my Alansky ever was was murder incorporated, never an intelligent man, just bulldozed people. And he was only four foot eleven. If you like the Tony Knapp interviews, you will have to read his book, My Father, My Don. There is much more information than what was in the interview, and I am sure, like me, you won't want to put the book down. So to find out how to purchase this amazing true story, just go to Tony's website at www.myfathermydon.com. Well, you think you enjoyed segment two? Wait until you see segment three, where Tony talks about Frank Sinatra and his situation in Sin City, Las Vegas. I gotta be free. 